I'd like to just yeah say one, it's a real privilege to be able to come here this afternoon and, and speak, and also to uh, represent today, I'm speaking as a, uh, oh, there's a few coming in, uh, through a, a, a contracting and consulting role that I've been doing with Ducks Unlimited. So my other various and diverse things that I'm involved in, um, that's, that's a separate thing today. So the title of the, of the presentation that I kind of poorly placed with white writing today um, is it's a wetland rest, retention and restoration business case um, in the settled areas of Alberta um, with a specific emphasis on the Vermilion River watershed. And this is a similar activity that I, I conducted in Ontario for Ducks Unlimited there and, through the, and in collaboration with their Ministry of Agriculture. And uh, it seemed the uptake was good to have something like that out in Ontario, so there was a desire to see if we could do something similar in the prairies. Uh, this is the first segment, this is for Alberta, but I'm also working on that for Saskatchewan and Manitoba. It was funded by the Institute for Wetland and Waterfowl Research from uh, the Ducks Unlimited Centre out in Okanuk Marsh, and, uh, but also through BHP Billiton, actually and uh, the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture. And their goal is to increase our scientific understanding for decision making. Um, and that's what BHP said. So we want, we want to know a little more of what's going on here. Our goal is to look more at the economic benefits for the public, but also the economic costs for the public. Because uh, here's another question. So it's interaction. It's my vestiges of my university teaching, I guess. How many of you are economists in the crowd? Oh, good. We got only two. Excellent. <laughs> there are, we're an odd sort, so that's good. Um, <laughs> sorry, too. Um, but the idea is that we don't just love wetlands and, and just go forth and say, let's, let's protect these things. That they're, they're good for a number of reasons, but they're only good. The idea, and that's why ducks came to me, they said, we want to understand also the cost associated with them. Uh, because, uh, frankly, we all face decisions every day and trade-offs, and uh, you know, it might make sense to drain some wetlands somewhere, sometime, heaven forbid. But it is uh, something we have to consider, and also as we're looking in a time of financial restraint, might be the correct word, when we have a provincial budget that is, you know, we're realizing that we've decreased some revenues, we have to we heard from uh, the minister just a few minutes ago about, you know, we've got to cut back in some areas. So our understanding, I think it's quite timely that we're able to say, hmm, what's going on financially? And uh, maybe in some cases it isn't uh, a good idea to, and locations to restore wetlands. There's a background, and this is, uh, you all know, I'm sure, this situation, uh, human population is growing. We're seeing urban expansion, we're seeing agricultural conversion. Um, I won't attack agriculture, I'm a farmer, so sometimes I think I can, but I won't here. Um, that uh, we're seeing large-scale conversion and then loss of, of wetlands, but also an increasing understanding. If you look in the language that uh, political figures say, or not just the, the academics anymore, this idea of environmental services, of valuation of social impacts, of environmental things, this idea of sustainability, the three-pillared approach, this is something that is coming, whether some of us like it or not, it's in the language, it's in the psyche of these people, and so it's then coming into, uh, you know, public, the public arena. And we know, and, and I'm sure many of you have heard the, or seen on websites or articles saying, wetlands do this, 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 this. And so we know, we understand that this is coming. So this is the background that we're setting it within. We also know that there's a policy background occurring in Alberta. Um, for those of you involved in ESRD, you'll maybe be more intimately familiar with this, but and I tried to kind of go back, I don't know if that was a good idea, but flow back from where we are today. Um, the interim policy in 1993 set some um, goals. It's, oh, is it a little vague? Sure, sure it is, let's be honest. And then it was sort of brought together a little more. We have the Water Act, the Water for Life strategy, then we have these mitigation guidelines. And then finally, there's this idea, and for a long time, and I don't know if it's, um, 
why necessarily, but it's been a number of years that there's been this attempt that we want to formulate and finalize a provincial wetland policy and actually get it across. Now, it, has been, it hasn't come to fruition yet, but we heard again from Minister McQueen a few minutes ago that by the end of the year, so, so you know, I had a tape recorder, right? And we have laughter in the back, excellent. That's a supportive laughter, I'm sure. And uh, it's gonna come across. There we go, so you have it. And so, so I'm a little tongue in cheek and I'm saying that because sometimes you think, oh, it keeps going and perhaps it's political suicide to latch onto that thing. But we do have a mandate and Redford's ministerial mandate, and as we think of this, it's looking at his integrated resource system that wants to, that sets and achieves the environmental, economic and social outcomes Albertans expect from resource development and maintains the social license to develop those resources. So there are a few words I want you to consider as I, um, very, in a very timely manner, go through my presentation. And uh, you know, I want us to think of the term social license, and then also what Albertans expect, and then those three pillars as we continue on. Now, again, as I mentioned, there's many sort of uh, studies that have occurred regarding uh, wetland ecological or environmental services. And so you see those um, not just from the private sector, you see or from consultants or from the academy, you also see them from government. You think of the environmental services pilot project that was conducted in uh, Shepherd's Slough by Alberta Environment just last year. These are, there's research coming out that we're, we're losing wetlands and, there's, and this might not be a good thing because they provide these services. And I'm going to not gloss over them, but uh, we're going to look maybe a little in more detail. But how many of you do see those terms a lot? And maybe they make your eyes glaze over now, but wetlands do everything. Um, uh, they, sorry, Tracy, they do, they do, uh, do a lot of things. But uh, including water purification, storage, flood control, groundwater resort, um, recharge as such. And as economists, we, design, we divide those into some of these more directly market, quantifiable things from the, free, from the that you can actually see the money on right off the bat, to the non-market um, work. And that was a lot of my research, and also Catherine Patman's in the back, and our graduate research was in that valuation. Now, again, we know that there's been loss occurring. No one's to blame, everyone's to blame. But we're seeing that 64% of wetlands have been lost in the white zone, and that this loss continues 5% annually. Now, and this is just a stat, I mean that in other parts of the world, this is occurring too. It's not an Alberta-specific problem, and every jurisdiction sort of takes different approaches. Um, I work a lot in Africa and India, and similar, similar projects there, uh, or problems there associated with wetlands. But we're seeing a loss, so what is there to maybe do? So as ducks came and they said, okay, can you provide this business case? Um, this, and, and as you try to formulate what it is, let's involve some stakeholders. So as this project evolved, um, there was involvement from Ducks Unlimited, Prairie Habitat Joint Venture, Alberta Agriculture, ESRD, as well as the Vermilion River Watershed Management uh, Team, and John Pomeroy's lab out of the University of Saskatchewan. And they said, as we talked, we said, okay, wetlands do these sort of, you know, we know they do some good things, but what's the most important environmental, oppressing environmental issue in the province right now? And I kind of give it away here, but what would you all think? You know, I, it, it was funny the kind of, because this work is occurring in, I've done it in Ontario, and then also, um, so dealing with their issues there in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, it's funny how surface water quality has really come to the forefront um, and, and this has definitely came out from those meetings um, here in Alberta. And this is, you know, we think of not just here of our, of our lakes here in the province, but um, cross-border issues. Where does all, a lot of our rivers run into? Lake Winnipeg. So you're getting some angry Manitobans. Nobody wants angry Manitobans coming down there and up the river to, you know, do, some, do something about it. It's, uh, but there's impacts, downstream impacts we have to consider. Um, there is recognition and action of this. And you think of the Bow River Phosphorus Management Plan that is coming out that has identified phosphorus as a major problem and that wetlands are a BMP of emphasis that they want to really focus on. 
Now, and this isn't new, as I mean, as a, uh, we're aware of this, Alberta Agriculture has had a phosphorus strategy for a while. Um, I'm quite aware of it as a, a farmer up in the cameras area with our nutrients that we're putting on the land, we're kind of concerned about some of the runoff. So why a business case? My, well, I'm really bad at these slides, aren't I? Because I give away my answers right there. But it's a story to justify financial investment. And maybe, you know, not to, to belittle all of you and say, well, I'm telling a story. But I think it is important for us to, to frame it in a sense. And the business case isn't just for technical experts. It isn't just for academics. It's also for the general public. That they can understand in layman's terms, perhaps, what is going on. And uh, we're all brilliant technical people here. But, uh, you know, at, at times you need to frame it a little differently. And so this captures the existing knowledge to support wise land use decision, and it's a vehicle for moving policy forward, and it provides a consistent message. So as we were looking at, if we're going to do a benefit-cost analysis of wetland, well, to me it's like, well, you can't just pull numbers out of the air. How many of you have seen some wetland studies that say they're worth gazillion dollars up here? Let's say them. Well, maybe they are. But let's uh, try to focus in on a specific watershed where we have accurate numbers, so we know the loss rates. And also, we have an uh, estimate of accurate biophysical numbers, because other, if you don't have that, the, the economic analysis is really baseless. So we found and collaborated with, uh, the, in the Vermilion River sub-watershed with John Pomeroy's lab, as well as um, some of the team there to, to build some of our numbers upon. And the scenarios we described, so we have an existing number of wetlands. The current area, and I can show you what that is, but we thought, let's have some ideas. If we're going to restore, we're going to lose wetlands, what does that mean? So let's have some ideas. So let's model on 25% loss, 50% loss, and 100% loss of the existing wetland area. And what would that mean for the biophysical, and hence the economic numbers? And then also restoration. So if we restore 25, 50, 100. Now, are, those, are the extreme numbers realistic? No. You're not going to go restore all the wetlands in the watershed. That's stupid. You're also not going to lose all of them either. That's equally unrealistic. But for the purpose, academics, we like to be stupid and put these sort of things up and say, what are the extremes? Let's consider that. Okay. And so from that, we have some of our phosphorus removal rates. And this is based upon... Uh, some of Suzanne Bailey's work and some of the numbers that we have from this area on what a wetland per acre, or hectare, pardon me, restore, retains. Um, if any of you are involved in the wetland policy, you know the debate that is currently on on function versus area. For With the current state of the economic valuation and biophysical numbers here, I had to revert to area because there's a lot of um, still discussion on the function. But we see that there is a loss that occurs and, uh, you know, higher benefits with higher restoration, of course. And then we have the change in benefits. So that's specifically for phosphorus. And that was based upon uh, the cost of removing phosphorus from water treatment plants. So that was our, our number, that the price tag we put on that. Which is defensible in the literature, not perfect, but um, we try to go with that. Similarly for nitrogen. I'm just looking at my time, I'm sorry. Um, similarly for nitrogen, uh, we did a similar exercise. And then we considered as well that there are other services provided. Um, you might have heard the term benefit transfers, maybe, maybe not. But um, it's an idea that if you have a wetland here and someone says, hey, you should save it because it can do this, well, we don't really know if that wetland can do it, but let's take a number from elsewhere, apply it there, and that'll have to do for now. Now, we had to do a little bit of that. However, we didn't go down to the, uh, I don't know, New York State or the Estuarine wet wetlands somewhere else. We used it right from in the prairie pothole region where there are results, but a couple of the studies I had to borrow from some of the Saskatchewan and Manitoba <coughs> numbers. And we also have for carbon and recreation. And please come if you want to discuss with me where these numbers were after, um, because for time. But then, as, then we apply that to, to the same scenario. And you see when we are losing wetlands that ev you know, if we lost 25%, there would be an equivalent amount of dollars lost. And then this relates, and specifically just looking at the nutrients, so the water quality effect, and uh, increase in nitrogen loading, increase in P loading, 
and uh, equivalent to a certain number. This is a nice, uh, yeah, the, an example um, of, of, of what that means to more the layperson. But then we look at the, uh, the costs. How many of you have, are landowners and have wetlands on your, on your property? Okay, we've got a couple. So we do too on our farm. I mean, we try to go around them and we try to do all these things and um, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. Um, but when you're looking at what costs, and as an, econo as an economist, we tend to divide it into these fixed restoration costs of, okay, if we're going to restore, how much is that going to cost? And this number is taken from, from Ducks Unlimited in that East Central Alberta area. So it's about $10,000. That includes the, the direct cost of, of, of um, actually building them or, or getting them to a functional state, as well as um, the future, the management costs. Okay? Now then we also look at opportunity costs. And this is uh, what we as farmers, and I'm basing this upon agriculture because in this watershed, that's the primary um, driver. Um, it's the lost income that comes. Okay? So if you're going to have a crop and you're going to have to give it up to keep that wetland on there, this is what essentially it's worth. So we're looking at about $125 a hectare per year. The Alberta Ag guys thought that was, that was right on for that area. Okay? And then we fit it. So now we've got our benefits and, cost, and our costs and we want to compare them. And this is where the social return on investment framework, uh, quite common in certain schools of thought, um, has been used by federal governments um, as well as universities and, and in some parts in eastern Canada. So it's this framework for measuring and accounting for a broader concept of value. It's this idea of the three pillars of sustainability. And it, this, with the focus to reduce inequality and environmental degradation and uh, incorporating the social, environmental, economic costs and benefits. So that's where we were looking at it. For those of you that like uh, equations, uh, we, I compared it under various time horizons with a 3% discount rate, which is um, perhaps, well, it, it's, it, I think it's about right. Could be a little lower sometimes in, for environmental goods and services, but the financial and econ people, we kind of think 3% is okay. We discount over time and we look at some scenarios. So we get the, SR, the social return on investment ratio is the benefits to the cost. So if you invest $1, what are you going to get out of it? Okay, and so think of that when we look here. Finally getting to something. <laughs> um, that for retention, this is what we got, that, uh, that every dollar invested, so the cost that you look on an annual basis, yields you about $6.91 in return when you consider the social inclusion, right? Restoration, and you look how it shrinks. And this makes sense because, uh, and this is over 10 year, a 10 year time horizon. Um, when you look at that, this, what that tells us is that retention is a good thing. And as the more you restore, man, it doesn't quite work as well. And so this is, a, we have a lot more on this particular slide and, and a lot of background too. But this is sort of the general drift of what comes out of it. And so, you know, from that, you see that there's a significant loss benefit in terms of the phosphorus and the nitrogen, the nutrient loss, but also the other, the other benefits. Uh, retaining the current level of wetlands provides the highest return on investment and low levels, does make, low levels of restoration make some sense. The, as we consider that though, um, there is, when we look at those numbers, and there'll be you know, critics in the room saying, well, you know, where exactly do those come from? I think, and as Vermilion representative, if we're expanding this out to the, the white zone of Alberta, okay? Well, there's a few points on that. Uh, Vermilion maybe isn't the best example in the province and, and represents the whole white zone. I'll freely admit that. But there is a lot of heterogeneity that exists in the white zone. And Vermilion itself has uh, much lower values. I mean, how many of you are going out to go fishing and sunbathing and swimming in the lakes and the sloughs in Vermilion area? Not too many, I would assume. So we have a conservative estimate there. And also, I did not include in the benefits anything about water quantity, anything about erosion control, or uh, biodiversity, or, or groundwater recharge. Why? Because I could not ethically, I think, put a number to that that I felt wasn't defensible. And so, I kept that out of the equation, which means that these are conservative estimates, which has uh, some impact. 
I also want to say briefly on public demand, this group, all but two of you, demand wetlands, don't you? At least that's what I took out of your hands up cheering earlier. Um, this is some work that I did with uh, colleagues Lee Foote and Amy Krogman. And we got some, we took people, representative samples from the urban, rural, and, and suburban um, population out to, to understand their perceptions. And also, the Population Research, uh, Research Lab um, did a study last year, and we put in some questions. And this is what Albertan said. This is last year. This is a representative, defensible sample that 79% that we should do more to protect the natural environment than comparing that to other rankings. And that 85% are concerned about wetland loss. So when you hear the words from the minister or all of you from the government that we want to hear from Albertans, well, this is hearing from Albertans. And also, and we look at that, that when we rank wetland loss, the only thing it comes second to is public's concern about chemical pollutants in lakes and rivers. And so this is, uh, I mean, you can access the research lab's um, results from this and see more about it. But this is something, I think, that lends some credence. So what are the recommendations from it? I'm just about out of time. Um, stop the loss. What does that mean necessarily, stop the loss? Well, one, we know it's financially the best option. So if we have to start messing around and restoring wetlands all over the flipping province, that's going to cost more money and it doesn't make a lot of sense financially and it's also difficult to do. And, uh, then, and that has some implications, I think, in the mitigation guidelines when we look at what are they? Avoidance, right? That's the first one. Maybe we should look more at that. If that makes financial sense, which this research says it does, you know, we want to we stop that. And I think that's the idea. Stop the bleeding kind of approach. Um, and, and if, because once we try to get those things back, it's very difficult. Yet, we can go for a moderate degree of restoration. I'm not going to be a radical here and say, let's restore every wetland because I love them so. Um, let's be realistic. Let's be economists and realize there are trade-offs out there. And then when you bring in this social license issue of Redford's mandate, and we, quite surprising, to, maybe not surprising, but interesting to hear it said many times today from Ernie Hui, I think that's how you say it, and Anna McQueen, that, you know, social license, we want this social license. Well, Alberta is under international um, scrutiny. Frankly, when we look at very num, you know, the pipelines or any sort of activity, the oil sands. So by having, and as we come down here, an effective wetland policy that achieves um, certain outcomes for the for the function, uh, it enhances our social license and makes <laughs> makes us look good. And uh, if you know, that's that's a valuable reason too, I think. And uh, and it brings the financial component in, which can help in in some of the decision making. Anyways, I'm, I'm out of time, and I uh, just want to acknowledge Ducks Unlimited Canada, BHP Billiton, Prairie Habitat Joint Venture. I also forgot the Vermilion people. 